Uh, please use the chat function to post questions. Uh, I sincerely hope we'll get to as many as possible towards the end uh, of the session. And we are recording this webinar to be posted on uh, the Digital Culture Network's YouTube channel. And if you aren't aware of the Digital Culture Network, it's an initiative set up by Arts Council England, uh, made up of nine tech champions to help arts and culture organizations with their digital ambitions through one-to-one -one support, uh, through the production of resources and through kind of training kind of days or webinars a little like this uh, and since we started we've been very lucky to build um, uh, and forge a great relationship with the team of Google Arts uh, and Culture uh, and up to now they've helped us and partnered with us on uh, kind of live training days um, but also now are partners with us in this uh, the Connected to Culture series uh, of webinars and over the last couple of months the team there put together a really handy guide uh, again, called uh, connected to culture. That kind of, that, that I'm sure, touch on some of the things that we'll uh, that we'll kind of get through uh, today. So Emily from the team uh, will kind of talk about that towards the end of the hour that we have. Uh, but in terms of this session um, and this series, you know, it's come about because over the last couple of months, you know, we've definitely seen people take the opportunity to kind of maybe rethink. Uh, their approach to, to content uh, with better, kind of more widespread use of digital technology, and also in some cases look at their kind of business models. And this today is about kind of taking content or taking uh, events online. And I should say, you know, what this session isn't uh, is a practical how-to guide about how you kind of realize an idea and take it through to publication. You know, there are plenty of resources, excellent resources, uh, by organizations like The Space, the Arts Marketing Association, the Digital Culture Network, even uh, even kind of the playbook that I mentioned by Google Arts and Culture. You know, what today is about is an opportunity to hear from arts and cultural leaders who over the last four or five months have really kind of lived that migration. And, you know, it's it's an astounding kind of truly excellent panel that, I, that I'm thrilled to introduce. Um, and, and we've got kind of firstly Lisa Mayer, uh, Lisa is the CEO, the co-founder, artistic director, you know, of Capsule, uh, an organization known for producing dynamic and innovative work like Home of Metal and Supersonic Festival. So I'm going to pause there and see if Lisa is with us. Lisa, can you come off mute and say hello? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. And, so, and next up is Shana. Shana Jackson uh, is an author and the artistic director of the Site Gallery of Sheffield. Contemporary art space known for pioneering emerging art practices. Shana, can you come off mute, uh, mute and quickly say hello? Yeah, hello. I'm off mute, everybody. Hi, I'm Shana. So she we are um, Sheffield's leading contemporary art space focusing on new media, moving image and performance. And I'm going to talk to you today about websites. So website was a program. I say was, it is a program of activity that was mainly delivered online. Perfect. Thank you, Shana. Uh, and finally, uh, Molly Flatt, author, journalist, and as of six months ago, uh, the founder, producer, and creator, along with Kit Deval, of the Big Book Weekend. Molly, do you come off mute and say hello? Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Molly. Lovely to meet you all. Thanks so much for um, joining us. And uh, yeah, I'm going to bring uh, the perspective of having pulled together um, a three-day uh, literary festival, online book festival, in seven weeks uh, over lockdown, all virtual, and uh, hopefully going to um, do the the next iteration next year. So, um, yeah, excited to be here. Brilliant. Thank you all. So, Lisa, let, let's start with you. A couple of questions to start with. So, firstly, do you want to tell us about kind of Supersonic and how it morphed into Supersonic? Just give us a little bit of context there. But also, you know, I'm interested in understanding how that came about and, uh, and also what your intentions and what your ambitions were for that migration. Sure. So in 2019, we'd celebrated our 15th edition of the festival. We'd got a five star review in The Guardian named the UK's best small festival. So we were on, on a roll, as it were. And then comes along March and it, it was like a house of cards just watching the entire sort of live music industry and ecology sort of fall. In, in front of our eyes within a, a matter of days. And it felt incredibly shocking. And I think for the first couple of months, uh, there was no room to be creative because it was just kind of dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with what was going on. But 
I, I'm someone that's had to shield and I've been shielding since March. And so around May time, I started to really miss that connection and that creativity that you have when you're programming and the connection that we've built with our audiences and our artists and, you know, our, our volunteers, the team. And so decided that we wanted to do something to mark what would have been the weekend of Supersonic. And so we renamed it Sofa Sonic to kind of be a bit of a play on the fact that it was going to take place at home and from the comfort of people's sofas. And I didn't want it to try to... Um, to replicate what a live festival would have been like because that that's not really it wasn't really possible but rather to take a, a sort of creative approach almost like a zine and kind of uh, program elements that are associated with the live music uh, and experimental music scene so being able to talk to artists about their other interests like cooking and being able to put on workshops and things like that and I think it was really important for us to kind of make some connection with our audience and I wanted to see like we are here today like if something was funny that we were all going to laugh together at the same time so we reached out to a, a number of artists and through their generosity from about May uh, just under two months we were able to pull together uh, a full weekend uh, festival um, and it included things like yeah, doom, doom yoga workshops, kids gigs, um, you know, panel discussions uh, with artists discussing kind of key, uh, you know, key things that were, um, you know, important to them around the political climate, social change, etc. But equally, it was for us as a, as an audience, as a community, to have to find a bit of escapism and to kind of enjoy being together. So that that was really how Super, Sofa Sonic came about, and in a very short time frame. And and, and Lisa, on on that short time frame, you know, because basically what we're talking about is moving an entirely live festival online in a very very compressed kind of time kind of timeline. Or you know, can you tell us about the, the the team that you had to deliver that, and what's what what were the sorts of things that you had to kind of turn your attention to and get done quite quickly. Well, I think it's my own fault, but it snowballed really very quickly. So what started out, were, you know, in terms of reaching out to a couple of artists and asking them to be involved, soon sort of turned into this full three day programme that would kick off at 11 in the morning and finish at, you know, one o'clock at night. And actually, it was only the three of us. We're a tiny team as a core team. So there were three of us doing everything. And then we, we brought on board um, a tech person to do all of the live streaming element. So I did the programming and liaising with artists um, and the labels, et cetera. And then over the weekend, I led on res responding to things like the live chat to keep a dialogue going with the audience. And Kate from our team did a lot of research around safeguarding, especially because we were doing things like kids gigs online. Um, and also she dealt with the back end of the ticketing, which is a huge undertaking when you're hosting closed Zoom events. Um, and then Rosie from our team led on all of the marketing and she created all of the idents for the for the streams and created voiceovers in between each elements of the of the live program just to, so it all felt like you you know that it, it wasn't just a passive thing but that there was activity happening all the time and with her sort of narrating what was happening. So, so essentially, a very, very small team. It was all hands on deck. One kind of specialist tech person, but generally, the same small team that you had delivering Supersonic as a live event were, were now delivering Sofasonic as an online event. Well, if you think for Supersonic, we probably have about 200 people working on it because we've got sort of 70 plus volunteers. We've got a huge production team. We bring in a lot more freelancers, but actually, I think because it, it sort of snowballed so quickly, we thought it was manageable just to do as the three of us as our core team. Um, but I think if we were going to do it again, we'd definitely bring in some more support um, to be able to kind of lead on areas like the live chat and things like that, keeping those sort of conversations going, because it was a huge undertaking. And, and Lisa, the one thing that I kind of noticed throughout the weekend was there were different, or you were trying different revenue generating models. So you were selling tickets, there was a pay what you like kind of approach to a couple of events. You know, there was also a donation button. You know, by by trying those different things, you know, like what did you learn? And did you get a sense that, you know, when you're thinking about future events that this actually might be monetizable in some way? 
Well, I mean, it's not comparable in any way to what we bring in in terms of ticket sales and bar income from, you know, doing a full festival. But certainly, I think the li the elements that were interactive, so the workshops, are people are very happy to pay for those. Um, and I think it's also about the quality of what you're providing as well. And I think it's also having that conversation with your audience that they're not just passive consumers but actually they're helping to support to keep you and the artists going in a, you know longer term so i think you know having all three elements work very well for us and we we raised about seven thousand uh, pounds of which we were able to give 25 percent to the trussell trust which is um for our local food banks and it, so again it was like a win-win in that we were able to pay the artists we were able to give some money to the trussell trust um, we are funded by Arts Council, so our core costs were being covered in terms of a, as, as a, a small team. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, there, there are opportunities to monetize elements of it. And I've certainly noticed recently that there are artists like Lancome and uh, Richard Dawson has just announced that he's doing a live show, a live stream from the Barbican. And I think if, if you have a loyal fan base, they will pay uh, for content. But it has to be of a certain quality. But we also made it pay as you want, so that we weren't excluding people that were either on low wages or, you know, were in a, a difficult financial position at the moment. We didn't want to exclude anyone. Uh, and Lisa, with with live events still being somewhat uncertain next year, you know, how has how has this year's experience affected how you're thinking about and planning next year's supersonic slash silversonic? Yeah. So I think. <laughs> You know, on the one hand, it was it's it was devastating to kind of see how fragile we are. Um, but on the other hand, I think it allows for kind of creative opportunities. So, you know, for instance, there were a number of artists that we were able to reach out to who were part of the programme that ordinarily would be far too expensive um, in terms of their logistics. You know, we'd have to get a first class flight and we'd have to have their entourage, huge fees to be able to get them to be part of the festival. But actually, by doing it online, we were able to be quite ambitious about the types of artists that we wanted, um, you know, to be part of this. So that's been incredibly positive. And I think similarly, we we had, you know, a number of um, artists who were based in places like Brazil. Like one of our panels had artists from Brazil, from Germany, from the UK and the US. And you know, again, we probably couldn't justify spending that sort of money to bring them physically to be part of the festival in normal time so you know I think in that way it, it allows you to reach out to a broader uh, and, and more ambitious uh, you know group of artists um, and also it allowed us to really start to um, you know build our audience via YouTube like we started off with something like 700 subscribers uh, before this and then by the end of the weekend or thereabout we had like 1,900 plus subscribers so we know that we're now building an audience for online content and so I think going forward we'd have to you know we would be oh and the other thing is that we had like 57% of our audience online over that weekend were international and if you think that normally we probably have four and a half thousand physical people at the festival but in terms of like the live views we had just under 10,000 and then for the weekend itself so 10,000 live but uh, just under 15,000 for the you know watching within the the weekend so you know we're able to reach a wider audience which was which was really exciting but i think in terms of a hybrid we we are really excited to think about streaming going forward but it is i think to do to do live music, you have to have kind of multi cameras. You want to be able to edit in, in a live scenario. So I think we'd have to do additional fundraising to look at how we integrated that into part of our program next year. But it's definitely it's it's given us the momentum and the confidence to be able to do that. And certainly in the interim, until we can get to some sort of normal, we will continue doing things like the kids' gigs online uh, and panel discussions, etc. Brilliant. Thank you, Lisa. So, Shana, to you next. And I think with Site Gallery, you know, it's obviously this is, this is an environment that you're comfortable in anyway. So, so I imagine the shift to digital or using new technology wasn't quite as big a shift for you as the team as it may have been for other organisations in the sector. But you still launched a website with, 
you know, over the and over the last couple of months, kind of shown some really interesting content. And with your usual focus on audiences, how did you decide what type of content would work and which platforms they should go on? You know, what were the processes and how did you how did you begin to work that out? Yeah, so um, we launched website, I think, around four days after the gallery closed. So the gallery closed on the 17th of March. And we're very fortunate that we have um, the internal expertise to be able to make something like that possible. So when we were deciding to deciding what content that we wanted to put online, we looked at the, the events and the works and the content that we want that we had. Um, and we were looking at the platforms that we were active on or what we could do. So um, we didn't want to just do, you know, um, take us a, a video of the gallery space and just plop that online and say, OK, you're in the space. It, that's not an adequate replication. And we wouldn't want to be replicating anyway. So we were looking at things like, OK, our young people's groups, how, where can we do those that are safe? Um, a safe space that everyone can log in. So we started with Zoom and then there was issues there. And then we went to Google, Google Meets. So we delivered all our young people's programs to Google Meets. Um, in terms of reading groups, we did those via Zoom. And then we did more interesting, or what's it more interesting, more um, um, uh, developed ideas where we had a coding workshop that was delivered live and then recorded. And so people who missed that could then uh, join in. And we did things that were quite simple, like artists taking over our Instagram platform. So the thing that we were really asking ourselves during this period was, how do we support our audiences and artists? What can we do? How do we give them outlets to, to work and engage? And so we were going across as many platforms as we could. And to do that, I mean, like practically what we did, we were all working from home. We have what we call a daily stand up at 11, where we all check in. But what we really do is, we work in Google, everything we do is in the Google Doc. So we made, the first thing we did was make a spreadsheet, um, listed out you know, our goals, our aims, what we're trying to do, um, and then listed the activity that we had coming up physically in the gallery, and then started brainstorming ways that we could um, adapt that. Um, so we did things like uh, how to dance on TikTok for family audiences, just really thinking about things that you could do at home that weren't too demanding that you could just drop in and enjoy brilliant thanks shana and and um, with like with the site gallery you know it plays such a prominent role within the local community but it also you know has a considerable national and international reputation like how do you practically how do you how do you kind of how do you how do you strike that balance between Kind of putting things online that maybe ideally you'd want to kind of reach out to a local audience but kind of realizing that some of the things that you put on might have a bit of a broader reach you know how do you you know how do you, how do you do those things online you know it, in the way that you would naturally kind of with the gallery i think well you can't control the audience well you can but when you're broadcasting live to a platform you can't control the audience and we don't necessarily want to so you're right, we're very much about Sheffield and part of the local community, but for us, reaching out internationally enhances what we do locally. So it was really exciting to see people from the Orkney Islands signing up for a family workshop or people in Chicago. It was really interesting for us. But um, our local is our core. So our newsletters, for example, are predominantly for a local audience. So everything goes in there first. They get first dibs. Um, it, equally on our social media and through our networks um our local communities know first they have the first you know um uh, chance at getting tickets uh for things and then it goes wider but i've it's it's something that you have to constantly balance and think about in terms of the content that you're delivering so things definitely you know some content has um a specific local focus so we started a new strand of programming called site salons which was where a local artist would be in conversation with somebody that they wanted um and we were specifically talking around um aspects of lockdown and intimacy and from through a sheffield lens so that you know had you know more local focus and then you know we did um we've had three open calls during this period which went in which were um um launched internationally and available for artists working across the globe to apply for so it was for us it was 
constantly balancing balancing it out because yeah we wouldn't we would never neglect our local audience yeah great okay and and then you know as an organization that's quite comfortable in this space anyway you know is there a golden rule is there kind of a tip that you pass on to kind of other organizations or even kind of the people on this call yeah absolutely so um so before i start before i worked at Sci, i also used to work at tate gallery and i used to work there for about seven years in the digital department and what i used to find one of the things that i really didn't like was when i'd go to um events or conferences workshops and there would be like someone from an organization who was actually quite smug saying oh you know just do a partnership with Minecraft or do a partnership on Spotify. And it's like, that is really very, very hard to do unless you're a massive brand. So I don't, I'm not gonna suggest anything like that. The only thing I suggest is doing, <laughs> doing one small thing that is achievable and within your remit. And it tends to be um, looking, making sure your website is um, available and optimized for mobile. I mean that's a huge thing, but a really great thing to do. Um, check that your you ha if you have a newsletter, make sure that your data is all nice and clean. And by clean, I mean it's all segmented and you can do things with it. I wouldn't worry about um, doing huge. If you don't have the capacity to do something big, then don't do it. And if your audience isn't asking you for something big and flashy, don't do it. Think about who your audience is and what they need and how you could fill that gap. And it might be a series of tweets. It could be a, a few pictures from your collection or your archive on Instagram, or it could be something more flashy, but don't burn yourself out trying to do something whiz bang, <laughs> to use a technical term. <laughs> Thanks, Shana. Thank you very much. So, Molly, over to you now. So, obviously, you know your situation again is completely different. Uh, so, six months ago, the big book again didn't even exist, uh, and now it does. It's a thing, and it's a really successful thing. So, can you tell us, uh, you know, give us a little bit of the background? You know, where did the idea come from? What were the motivations? Yeah. Um, so, the whole thing start started with a. Um, Actually, a tweet by uh, Kit Duval, my co-founder, um, who's an incredible uh, author, as I'm sure um, many of you know, and a kind of activist in publishing as well. I think, uh, like so many of us, um, Lisa mentioned this before, she'd seen the, the flurry of cancelled events um, happening uh, kind of throughout um, the end of winter and the beginning of spring. Um, and particularly kind of literary festivals. And Kit and I actually met originally at Chipping Norton Literary Festival um, when we were both um, promoting books. So, you know, we knew from first-hand experience how powerful the festivals were in connecting readers together and connecting authors to readers and also the incredible amount of work that goes into them. So it was an incredible shame to see all of this fantastic programming kind of being wasted, essentially. So Kit sent out a tweet going, oh, you know, it." it's terrible to see this. It would be amazing if there was some, you know, I wish there was somewhat, something I could do to, to salvage it. So then I think um, Sarah from the Arts Council uh, literature team saw this and tweeted back at Kit saying, oh, well, you know, if you could think of something, you should definitely get in touch because we're looking for ways to support the arts during this time. At which point Kit emailed me um, because she knew I kind of uh, had a background in tech. Um, and said, you know, do you think we could do something? Could it be a digital festival or something? Um, and I said, yeah. Uh, interestingly, um, I also program Future Book, which is the booksellers annual conference for the book trade. And that year, um, uh, a company called My VLF, My Virtual Literary Festival, had won our um, kind of technology startup pitch off. Um, for the publishing industry. Um, so I said, well, why don't we talk to those guys? You know, maybe they'd be up for it. Um, and they were. So it, it was uh, an incredibly fast rolling ball, really. The BBC then um, had been fronting their 100 novels that changed the world. So she got in contact with the BBC and very quickly, it was clear the BBC and the Arts Council together could kind of fund this. So um, yeah, it ended up being seven weeks from Kit's first email to me going, do you think this could be a thing, to um, a three-day festival um, in May, 
uh, which took uh, programming from um, some literary festivals that have been cancelled across the UK and put on various of those sessions that um, would have been happening. And you, you kind of you you know you run through the evolution there, but there's there's quite a significant thing in there for me, and that is like the choice to use my VLF, so kind of a bespoke or a new platform versus yeah. going for platforms that are kind of are more easily accessible or um, like I don't know YouTube or something like that. You know, talk, talk us through kind of why you went for my VLF over one of those kind of one of the usual suspects. Yeah, you know, it, it was partly pure instinct that um, Kit had contacted me and they were front of mind. Um, it was, a lot of it was to do with production work. So this Big Book Weekend was literally Kit and I who, you know, are also writing new books. And, you know, I've got day job as a journalist and Kit does many, many other things as well. So it was partly the fact that we needed a team um, and that's what my VLF do. They uh, they don't they hadn't done festivals before. They tended to do more um, panels and kind of one off events. But we knew that they could. We gave them our program and gave them the contacts. They could organise the filming, um, edit edit the pieces lightly, um, and manage the the as live streaming of the festival, including um live chat. So that was a big thing for us. Their platform had a um text live chat that we really liked the idea that you could watch the video and listen you could ask questions which slightly replicated the feel of a real life virtual a real life um book festival but that would be much less intimidating for people who weren't used to going to events um like that but also that you could chat to the authors um who joined in so you know there were there were functional features also my vlf is um built in a very visual way it's, it's kind of 3D, it's built to look like you're walking into a venue and you navigate to the to the theatre and you watch. And again, we thought for, as it turned out, the feedback we got is that was a real positive because actually it's very easy for a lot of us to think that things like YouTube are second nature, but they really aren't um, for some people out there who might be interested in viewing content. So something that replicated a physical space, but in um, a virtual site uh, had benefits. Um, so a lot of it was to do with lo workload, some of it was to do with aesthetics, um, and some of it was just kind of pure luck and instinct, really, as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Molly. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my interrogation there for the moment and, and turn to a couple of the questions that have come in. Uh, and, and I'd also going to remind people, if you've got any questions for the panel, please use the chat function to get them in. But we've had plenty on registration, and I'm going to kind of ask one that's come in uh, from Susie Biller of Kettle's Yard and Susie's question is uh, what have we learned about digital audiences in the last few months are they more diverse than on-site audiences are we reaching different people so I'd love to I'd love to get the panel's view on this one um, so Lisa can any any thoughts well I you know the big issue really is access isn't it because we make an assumption that everyone has got access to the internet so um you know when we're doing our kids gigs there i'd say the audience is broader but more localized um whereas when we did them online we've got people that wouldn't physically be able to come to uh, one of our kids gigs because they might be based all around the country or or internationally but there are absolutely issues that need to be addressed in terms of access still thank you lisa shana any thoughts I echo what Lisa says completely about um, access and the assumption that everybody has really swift broadband because they don't, or you know, iPhone eleven plus 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 one. They just don't have that. Um, but I think we need to really think about audiences um, a bit more segmented um, because a digital audience is not, you know, it's not for. It, what, what am I trying to say here? Your digital audience is still um, specific to your work or your organisation. So, because we put things online, yes, I mean anybody could have looked at it, but of course they won't. The, the internet is, you know, the wild west. So we really still thought about, okay, well, who would this be interesting for? Do you know if we make this, who would? be the kinds of people who would um, attend attend virtually. So I, I think it's still worth using your audience frameworks that you have for your physical um, 
experiences and just kind of extrapolate them online if that makes any sense yeah it, do, it does and, and shana how, how successful was that use of the of kind of audience framework was did you did you kind of either reach your targets or fulfill your goals in terms of the different types of audiences that you kind of hope to see in real life or you know was it kind of a similar type of person online um it was slightly different but it was because lockdown moved so quickly and moved through so many different phases since it started it feels very different now to it did to march we didn't set like you know we weren't saying oh we need to get 100 people to this or 50 people to this it was more like okay let's see what happens and let's hope that we get these kinds of people through the you know the outreach that we've done but it wasn't we didn't set ourselves strong targets we were just trying to survive um but we did see we did see different types of audiences absolutely but now the question is i mean maybe this is a question that we'll get to is you know what happens now we've 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 engaged with these audiences um we we be in sight because it's baked into our remit we would want to carry this on but you know now we've got these people in our communities how do we continue to serve them yeah good point and we've had a question on that and, and we'll get to that next maybe but molly what about that what, what about uh, that you know that question about audiences and you know were the ones that you saw online different to the ones that you'd see maybe as a kind of a live literature festival yeah, so that was a huge part of our remit. We quickly realised, you know, obviously we wanted to salvage um, salvage the programming and we were pretty sure that people who normally show up to literary festivals would find out about this and, and, and want, want to come along to it, you know, partly through those festivals, mailing lists and things, but partly because they were kind of hooked up to the same networks that we are. But we really wanted to use it as a opportunity um, for people who don't normally go to these events to feel comfortable. And I think what was brilliant from the feedback and we were overwhelmed by the the freshness of the audience we were reaching certainly in terms of literary events and we were very careful by the way literary does not appear anywhere in um in our messaging messaging and tone were really important but you know people saying things like you know i just i've never been to a book festival because i don't know what to wear or i'd never you know want to put my hand up let alone issues of you know, I'm a single mum and, you know, I can afford to go, but I can't take an evening or take time or someone going, you know, I'm an avid bookworm, but I'm in a wheelchair and getting to the authors I want to get is just too much hassle, um, whatever it might be. So I think we we were surprised ourselves, even though we had absolutely a kind of access and diversity agenda for audiences, at the strength of, um, of the feedback we were getting, which was all pretty unsolicited, actually. Um, so we're really excited about that and that's what we're pushing more and more for the, the second iteration of Big Book Weekend to um, is, is, is doing that in terms of tone, in terms of messaging, in terms of visual language um, and in terms of the people, you know, who we get involved. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's really exciting, I think, and kind of takes me slightly back to, uh, you know, the early days of the internet when I was working tech, and there was this excitement that, that, that um, the internet was a democratizing force. Shana's and, and, and Lisa's point about access is also huge though, and we're gonna extend the work we did the first time around with libraries, um, which can be incredible hubs for people to access online content um, who don't have Wi-Fi. So that kind of Wi-Fi poverty issue is one that actually I really hope that lockdown is gonna kind of surface and accelerate work around that. Thanks, Molly. And then, so then going back to the point uh, that Shana raised, it's a question from Kylie Lloyd. Uh, and, uh, and she says, uh, or she's interested in, in ideas about continuing the relationship with online audiences, you know, how to get feedback, how to engage beyond the event. So Molly, I'm going to come to you uh, and then maybe to Lisa, but first to you, Molly, only because, you know, you've got a brand new IP, you've got a very small team, you know, is, what are your thoughts on continuing that? kind of that journey and that engagement with the people that you've uh, that you reached out to and found yeah you know it's hilarious because any of you who now go on to the big book weekend um you know suite of social media presences will see just how silent they are you know it's kit and me there's a, a fantastic girl grace who volunteered to do our social media at the time and actually kit and i ended up paying her out of our our pockets because we were like she just did too much work and too good a job not to get paid for it um but you know we've 
we're we're busy. This is not our, our our job, and we don't have a lot of time. So actually, direct engagement of the Big Book Weekend brand with with audiences has been virtually nothing since the festival. Even though we're planning on putting one on March, I think that's partly a dose of realism about you know there's a lot of talk about ongoing engagement with audiences and making sure you're remaining you know getting all your touch points i mean that is a full-time job certainly for one person you know especially if you don't have an organization and a team that has the infrastructure to do that so i think again you know don't beat yourself up because this is you know there's a feeling that digital should be frictionless and fast and free and easy well on mass it gives that appearance but in terms of work for an ordinary person it's just the same you know it takes just as long to compose a good tweet as it does to write a good message you know to anyone so um i think i also am a little bit skeptical about how important it is for brands to be continually posting intriguing exciting engaging content to people i think buzz around an upcoming event or release of a bit of content is important and absolutely reach out to people and build those networks but i think you know we don't need to be shouted at all the time we are perfectly capable of dipping in and out of um of, of different organizations and, and and different festivals and you can be very targeted about that kind of thing so um you know we are we are planning as the festival as the festival approaches it's going to be number two is going to be in march yeah, next year on bbc platforms but we've still got our own website and our own um, social media presences and we are really eager to kind of maintain that relationship with our, our, our community um but you know also i think do they really care if we're posting cool memes on Instagram about like books or no, you know, you want to be talking to your friends or looking at your favorite band. So um, I think be realistic about the resource, but also be realistic about people giving a FECK. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Uh, and Lisa, um, from the perspective of, you know, supersonic, more established, uh, you know, what's, what's your take on, on that question? Well, I, I think that we, it's important for us to continue a relationship year round. And, you know, even if it's in, in a small way, the great thing about doing all of the content, you know, online over that weekend is that we were then able to take elements of it and re-edit it and then release it. And so we can slowly but surely over the next few months, we've got some really rich content. I mean, one of the things that we did learn is that we didn't put it up away afterwards and actually other sites uh, took our content and so like one of the interviews that we did was on another site and it had, uh, you know, another YouTube channel and it had something like 35,000 views. We asked it, them to take it down. But by the time we've got it to ours, you know, 35,000 people have already seen it that aren't on our channel. So I think though, that's one of the things that we've learned is to be quite quick um, afterwards of kind of reposting uh, and sharing the content that was live streamed. And then we've do done things like, um, you know, podcasts and um you know, we've invited artists to make Spotify lists for us, curated lists, just, you know, keeping keeping some conversation going with our audience. But I think, like you say, you know, Molly, you're right. With some things, it needs that kind of moment, you know, around a festival. But for us, you know, we would have, we would ordinarily be doing a year round programme anyway. So we, we have that sort of continuous conversation with our audience. Thanks, Lisa. And I, I noticed Shana uh, nodding her head to, to both responses. So I just uh, just wonder, Shana, if there's anything to add? Uh, no, just uh, I agree with both of them, especially Molly. Um, we have a year round program. So there are moments where we have to um, engage and we need to engage. But I agree that there is this assumption that you need to be just tweeting inaneness. And it's like, for what reason? Molly's completely right. It's we, everybody is stretched and capacity is low, so be strategic and um, smart with the things that you're doing. Thank you all. All right, so next question now, uh, and this is coming in by the chat from Verity Shalika. Is there now digital fatigue for audiences? How do we keep them engaged without overloading them, especially if venues can't open slash events can't take place anytime soon? So kind of, kind of similar, but I think I'm in interested in that you know in in the first part of that question you know is there now digital fatigue for audiences uh what do we think shana go well, on yeah so i think it's i think digital fatigue is an interesting kind of an interesting phenomena because for me digital is part of well for me and for a lot of people but not for everybody part of everyone's everyday life. 
So you get up, you look at Twitter, you do Instagram, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not fatigued in that kind of respect. It means part of my life, part of my diet. But I think there is a kind of people's attentions are waning to the continual shouting of organizations specifically around especially when there's nothing to really talk about and when we were having a pre-meet about this we were talking about you know the different phases of lockdown so when when it first started it was and it, i'm pleased i'm caveating this i'm not i'm not being jovial um but there was like you know it started and everybody was very much into baking like the the, bre the bread and butter pudding phase of lockdown and then we went into the activism phase of lockdown. And now we're kind of in the, oh God, are we going back into the first phase? So I think that when it first, when we first went into lockdown, if you weren't directly affected or had friends and families who were who had the disease, it was kind of novel. And so it was kind of interesting to be in a webinar or watching something. But I think as it's that as the novelty's worn off, I think people are are kind of tired and are kind of replicating the patterns that we would do in real life or physically you know how many um you know how many films can i watch from a documentary festival in a week i've got other things to do i've got a job <laughs> i've got three jobs so um yeah it's the think about don't just flood the mark flood the market but don't just you know be chucking out content you don't have to just be strategic and be mindful of your capacity Great. And and Lisa, you're nodding your head. Can it agree, disagree, anything to add? No, I think it has to be about the quality of the content. You know, no one wants to see a badly filmed live set from someone's living room. You know, there were thousands of those. And I think part of our jobs as curators, programmers is to sift through and to and to find the best work. So I think that audiences are still with us as long as we're giving them high quality and interesting work that they would be coming to in real life. And I, I think like Sean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have 50 gigs in a week, would you? You might have one or two a month. So it's about choosing those moments and then making sure that you're marketing them, you're telling your audience about it. It's not just that they, you know, that people will automatically just come, you know, there's that relationship to the build up to an event. Brilliant. Thank you. And th thank you. Thank you, panel. And we, we are kind of approaching the end of our time. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to ask kind of Emily, as I mentioned earlier, to come in uh, and just mention the Connected to Culture uh, kind of playbook that they put together, which, as I said, you know, definitely picks up on some of the things that we've spoken about and mentioned today. So Emily, do you want to uh, kind of talk about it briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Owen. So hi, everybody. I'm Emily. I work at Google Arts and Culture, and I just put the link in the chat. Uh, so we put together a Connected to Culture playbook, and it's really, you know, they, Thank you, Lisa and Sharna and Molly, for all of your great ideas and solutions and all this inspiration. And I think, you know, if you're interested and you're inspired by all of this, uh, you can check out the playbook because um, there's a lot there's a lot in there that really shows you, OK, well, how do you actually, you know, start on some of this now? And um, I think Sharna, you know, you, you put it really well about how it's not always about those big things, but there's just, you know, small little things that you can do like uh, on social or, you know, just kind of optimization rather than big splashy events and stuff. And so really, you know, you can check it out and you can find everything from the little opt optimization efforts that you can do to all the way through to, you know, a big event if you want to. And so hopefully it's a it's kind of uh, helpful in terms of turning all of this great inspiration that we've heard here today into how you can actually execute and get started with some of this. And um, so yeah, have a look and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want any help. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and thank you, genuinely, Shana, Molly, Lisa, for your time. It's been fascinating. I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I think it's provided plenty of insight, plenty of practical tips as well, actually. Uh, so thanks very much for your time uh, and for agreeing to do it. And thanks to everyone who's been watching. Um, the questions that we had uh, in kind of on registration were numerous and excellent. Uh, thanks for the questions that have come in uh, since. And I'm sorry I haven't had a chance uh, to get around to as many as, as I'd like to. But uh, we appreciate your time. We hope you find it useful. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you at the next Connected to Culture webinar sometime soon. Enjoy the rest of your days all, uh, and we'll see you soon. Bye now.